The Persecution of the Holy Catholic Church by Tsar Nicholas I of Russia Excerpts taken from Tsar Nicholas I and the Holy See Written by Father T. J. Shahan, Doctor of Divinity The evil policy of Catherine II, temporarily or partially arrested in the reigns of the emperors Paul and Alexander, was consolidated and rounded out by her grandson, Nicholas. In the annals of modern persecution, he holds a unique and ominous place. During most of his reign, circumstances made him the dominant factor in continental politics, and he used his prestige to perfect certain traditional purposes of the Muscovite state, prominent among which was the thorough crushing of all Western influence and spirit, preparatory to the assertion of Holy Russia as the heir of Byzantine autocracy, the regenerator of Christendom, and the mistress of the Orient. His dream, says an accurate historian of Russian Catholicism, was that of all despots who are conscious of their power and accept unhesitatingly their allotted role, however fatal its ending. The realization of a triple unity, religious, political, and national, throughout an immense empire and contained every variety of worship, government and climate, the establishment by every and any means of an unnatural unity similar to that which the Russian uniform stamps upon an army made up of twenty races and peoples the straining in that sense of all the forces of an ultra-centralization that recoil before no degree of violence or cunning, no secession of failures or decrees. Such was the supreme aim of Nicholas I. During the thirty years that Providence tolerated in his hands the iron scepter that he seemed to have received from Peter the Great himself, his chief obstacle was the Catholic Church. Nicholas was to learn this in due time, Meanwhile, he set about the absolute ruin of the faith of Rome. He would enslave it by cunning regulations, seduce it by deceitful promises, or overwhelm it by the violence of open persecution. The bureaucratic character of the new empire, as established by Peter the Great, permits and assures the permanency and regular operation of any policy once inaugurated in its Russian state. If we consider the undeveloped condition of the Russian commonwealth and many human sympathies that feed its hopeless corruption, if we add its territorial vastness, the vague terror of a secret and sudden sanction of every absolute command, the universal ignorance and degradation of the popular mind, the skillful intermingling of racial hate, political dreams, and religious fanaticism, we shall grasp in a general way the ease and the confidence with which a born autocrat like Nicholas took up the policy of his grandmother and pushed it unhesitatingly to that degree of success which the God of Nation occasionally tolerates for the sublime purposes that are later made known to his children. For the greater humiliation of Russian Catholicism and the Holy See, the aged Archbishop of Mohi Li disappeared from the scene in 1825 only to make way for an even viler character, Joseph Shemezko. For fifty years, Sistrinitzwitz had drawn from the Russian treasury an annual salary of fifty thousand dollars, together with other prerequisites, for which Judas Price he had sold the cornerstone of Catholicism in Russia, its unity with the See of Peter. But Shemezko was destined to a more wretched fate, that of public apostasy, entailing the loss of the Ruthenian Catholic hierarchy, such as it then was, and of several million Ruthenian Uniites. Ecclesiastical treason is committed on helpless multitudes who have passed away before it dawns upon the world that an irreparable wrong has been committed. For obvious reasons, the agent of it is usually immune from personal punishment. Such a traitor is a father who betrays his children, a tutor who abandon his wards, an administrator who squanders an estate, Joseph Shimezko was born in the department of Kiev and was ordained a priest in the Catholic seminary of Wilna. In 1812, he was called to St. Petersburg as assessor in the Catholic College of the Russian Uniates. The advent of Nicholas opened a way to the ambition of the young Shimezko. In 1827, he laid before the new Tsar a plan for the abolition of the Uniates or Ruthenians. Nothing could have been more welcomed. It took up the secret suggestions made by Sistrinitzwitz in 1806 and was itself surrounded with deep secrecy until the accomplishment of its nefarious aims. He began by recalling the express intention of Catherine II to expiate the Russian Uniates in the conquered provinces. 
but after her death the local authorities relaxed their vigilance and even looked with favor on the Uniite clergy. A new case of 1800 treats the Uniites as Roman Catholics and places them under the direction of the Catholic College at St. Petersburg, then which nothing could have been more disastrous, especially as in 1798 their diocese had been re-established in Lithuania, since which date no more Uniite parishes returned to the state church. What are the causes of this reaction among the Uniites? Shemezko answers that it is partly owing to the influence of the proprietors of the soil. They are mostly converts to the Latin rite, while their dependent serfs continue in the ancestral Greek rite. The Uniite clergy sympathize with their benefactors, the Latin landlords. Moreover, the dispossessed Greek Uniite priests continue to enjoy in their parishes the protection of the Polish proprietor. Greek Uniite priests attend in Latin chapels and churches and even act as curates in the Latin parishes. Even Orthodox Russian parishes quit the state church occasionally and join the Uniite body. As many as 44 had thus gone over in the department of Minsk. Entire parishes of Greek Uniites had gone over to the Latin Rite in White Russia and in Lithuania. Similarly, numerous families and individuals. He did not add that this was done in the hope of preserving their faith and escaping a formal apostasy to the state church. Shemezko goes on to insist on the simultaneous education of the youth of both rites in the same seminaries. At the same time, the wealth and social position of the Latin clergy react strongly upon the Greek Uniite clergy. Had time been granted to the Empress Catherine, she would have completely abolished the independence of the Ruthenians. When Catherine tardily nominated an archbishop, Litovsky, of White Russia, he was urged, adds Shemezko, to obtain from Rome the restoration of the Ruthenian rite as it existed before the Council of Zamosk, the abolition of the commemoration of the Pope at the Mass and the Filioque in the Creed. What would be her attitude, he argued now, when the clergy of White Russia and Little Russia no longer conceals its preference for Latinism? Russian writers usually speak of Catholicism as Latinism. National pride and suspicion are thereby made auxiliaries of systematic distortion and mendacity in matters of religion. In order to check the growth of Catholicism among the Russian Uniites, Shemezko proposed to the Tsar the following measures. First, the creation of a special ecclesiastical tribunal for the Uniites, with the view of checking any additions to their rights and of compelling the exact observance of its ancient elements. This was aimed at the feasts and devotions with which the Ruthenian worship had been enriched since the 16th century, through contact with Catholicism. Second, the diminution in number and the territorial extension of the Uniite diocese, and the nomination to these few vast sees of bishops thoroughly cognizant of the imperial purpose and willing to execute it, i.e., traitors to Catholicism. Third, the creation of special schools and seminaries for the Uniites, from which all Latin students and influences should be carefully excluded. Fourth, the diminution of the Basilian convents, and their subjugation to the diocesan authorities. As the latter were now known to be traitorous agents of Catholicism, this was a double blow at Ruthenian monasticism, hitherto a very strong bulwark of the faith amid the disorder and ruin of the last fifty years. It was this subtle recasting of the discipline, education, and administration of the Ruthenian communities that, as we shall see, finally brought about the almost total extinction of Catholicism among the Uniites. These measures aimed at a gradual but sur segregation of the latter from all spiritual contact with their Latin brethren, at the suppression of all protest on the part of their shepherds, at the official distortion of the theology and history of Catholicism, at the extirpation of all lively piety and ecclesiastical independence among the clergy, and at the extinction of all ancient habits and customs that could in any way remind the Uniite peasantry of the center and head of Catholicism. Had Thomas Cromwell and his descendant Oliver Cromwell had been gifted with the propacity of the priest of Holy Kiev, what a wreck that might have made of Irish Catholicism! These few and large and simple measures, stubbornly carried out in the spirit of the curial advisers of Catherine, Calvinists, Jansenists, Voltarians, Gallicans, Fabronians, compassed the spiritual ruin of several million of innocent Russian peasants, 
inaugurated a persecution of unexampled tenacity and ferocity, and blasted indefinitely the hopes of ecclesiastical unity that Rome had so long and so tenderly nourished in Lithuania and the Ukraine. One more suggestion was made by Shemesko, the purchase of consciences at the price of money and honors, increases of salary, new and special insignia, and frequent subventions to the minor clergy, as proposed as arguments of an irresistible kind. On April 22, 1828, Nicholas I called into existence the Greek Unii College at St. Petersburg, soon to be a mere tool of the Holy Synod for the thorough Russification of the Uniite Catholics. It was a state bureau operating under the name of the now traitorous hierarchy of the Ruthenians, and destined to accomplish in one short decade the plan of Catherine II. In that time, it excluded the Ruthenian clergy, secular and regular, from all control of ecclesiastical education, installed lay agents and Protestants in control of ecclesiastical affairs, imposed its arbitrary decisions on the monastic houses in matters of eternal government and discipline, kept vacant with set purpose episcopal sees or filled them with aged, weak, or morally unfit appointees, confiscated repeatedly the wealth of the monastic houses and suppressed the multitude of them. After the Polish insurrection of 1830, many thousand of Polish children were deported to Russia. All communication with Rome was strictly forbidden. The most severe penalties inflicted on any who converted a Russian subject to Catholicism. Russian legislation on mixed marriages extended to Poland with the obligation of bringing up in schism all children of such marriages. At the same time, no Catholic priest could legally perform such mixed marriages. Many Catholic parishes were suppressed by the renewal of an old law of Catherine to the effect that no parish could consist of less than a hundred families. Catholic priests of the Latin Rite were strictly forbidden to administer the sacraments to Greek Uniites, and no community of worship was henceforth tolerated between the two rites. Schismatic Russian sees were established in old Ruthenian suppressed sees. Many churches taken from the Catholics even in Warsaw, and a total uniform of right established in 1834 between Greek Uniites and of the, the state church. In all these measures, and many others, Shemesko was the right hand and willing tool of Nicholas. He had been made the bishop of the Lithuanian Uniites in 1830 by the Tsar, and accepted by Gregory the Sixteenth, who was, of course, unaware that for three years he had been maturing the evil plan which he was to pursue, step by step, until his death in 1868, and for whose final completion he was to leave behind him others of the same breed. Thus, in 1831, he became president of the Greek Uniite College or Bureau. He ordered the withdrawal of the usual missals, rituals, and breveries of the Uniite clergy, and replaced them by similar works printed at Moscow by the Synod, but of course, without the commemoration of the Pope in the Mass or the recitation of the Filioque and the Creed. Any priest who refused to comply was punished by internment in some prison convent of Russia or even by exile to Serbia, while his wife and children were taken from him and inscribed on the registers of the state church. The ancient Catholic cathedrals of the Uniites were transformed externally and internally into Russian churches. The nomination of its pastors was taken from the Uniite Church and confided to the provincial governors, who placed in these offices vicious and corrupt men and removed every worthy and independent shepherd. A wretched subterfuge of Catherine was refurbished in order to withdraw many churches from the Uniites. If it appeared from the parish register that the church had been founded by Russian Greeks or had in any time belonged to them, the church was adjured to the dominant religion. Similarly, a handful of malicious or disgruntled parishioners could hand over their church to the state bishop and fix the stigma of legal apostasy on the faithful majority. Conversions to the state church were paid for at ruble per head. Schroeder, the Protestant governor of Webspec, received from Nicholas 33,000 rubles for as many Uniite souls converted to the emperor's religion. Ukas upon Ukas, treason upon treason, violence and hypocrisy, and quick seceding act mark this decade of sorrow and humiliation. Byzantinism and Slavophilism 
had so worked upon the soul of the Tsar that he came to be, as if it were, eaten by a subtle and fierce mysticism of proselytism unequaled in the history of mankind. Nicholas surpassed even Catherine, and interpreted her decrees in a more odious sense than she intended. Every Uniite priest had to choose between the state religion, imprisonment, the galleys, or the mines. It was a mercy when only their families were ruined. Shemezko's own father refused to apostatize and reproached his son for his criminal deeds. He owed it only to his advanced age that he was not deported to Serbia. Bolhok, the aged metropolitan of the Uniites, refused to associate himself with these measures and heroically bore the reproaches and menaces of the government which awaited impatiently the close of a life that yet withheld the consummation of the Ruthenian apostasy. His funeral, at least, was conducted according to the schismatic rite, and he was laid away among the Russian metropolitans in the cemetery of St. Alexander Nevsky. Thereupon took place the formal renunciation of the Ruthenian allegiance to the Holy See and the incorporation with the Russian Church of the Uniites of Lithuania and the Ukraine. The official Gazette of St. Petersburg published on February 12, 1839, the decree of a synod held by Shemesko with his creatures, the Bishop of Brezvik and the Bishop of White Russia, in which the three Judases proclaimed null and void the Union of 1595, and requested the Tsar to permit their return and that of their flocks to the Church of their Fathers. This monumentous step was followed quickly by a series of imperial decrees and corresponding acts of Shemesko and his fellow traitors that consummated the quasi-total abolition of Roman unity in Russia. The event was celebrated with public rejoicing. The Russian press proclaimed the extinction of a barbarous superstition, and protested beforehand against the judgment of history. It insisted on the peaceful nature of a triumph of persuasion and the overflowing joy of all the new converts at their restoration to the church of their origin, their native tongue, and their former faith. A medal was struck with the devise, separated through hatred in 1595, reunited through love in 1839. It was in vain that Gregory the Sixteenth protested in an allocution on November 22nd, the Tsar no longer feared or needed him. In the Pope's unhappy letter to the Polish bishops in 1832, on the morrow of the insurrection, the Russian autocracy had secured from Rome all that then seemed desirable and had seemingly exhausted the latter's power of retaliation. Secure against revolution at home, foremost in war and diplomacy abroad, striding with rapidity on the roads of India and Constantinople, the new Byzantium seemed really on the point of presenting to the astonished eyes of the western barbarians another Justinian who should scourge their lawlessness, abate their pretensions, and recast human society on the lines laid down by the Holy Synod, or rather by the dark and cruel spirits who work through that horrid puppet. The sufferings of the Uniite clergy and people in the former Russian provinces of the Kingdom of Poland since the advent of Nicholas I, have been so often told, and by such authoritative and eloquent pens, that a fresh recital of them seems unnecessary. Suffice it to say, that no form of persecution was spared them during his fateful reign. Long and cruel, and wantonly distant imprisonment of courageous village priests and bazillion monks who refused to read the new liturgical books, quasi-enslavement under immoral and apostate brethren, confiscation of their small properties, scattering of their families and incorporation of their children with faraway schismatic families, exile to Serbia, frequent scourgings and servile work of especially humiliating character, arbitrary deportation from province to province, enforced ignorance of all outside sympathy, contemptuous betrayal of every appeal to the heart of the little father of all Russians. What measure of oppression was left untried by the bureaucrats of St. Petersburg and the fanatics of Moscow in the seemingly interminable reign of Nicholas? The cruelties practiced on the Ruthenian clergy were repeated with the unspeakable severity against the numerous parishes that resisted manfully and openly the power of the northern colossus. Several authentic acts of these common martyrdoms are extant and cause the pages of Eusebius of Caesarea and Cyprian of Carthage to pale before these unadorned tales of Russian malice. 
It may be that a clement and lax execution of rigorous legislation is characteristic of Russian power. If so, the Ruthenians are a certain exception, and their attachment to Rome the unpardonable crime of a Russian subject. Who would not be moved to tears by the various stories of the dragooning of certain villages? All resemble one another in their simple and monotonous brutality of injustice. Protestant governors and Russian popes enter the Uniite hamlet, seize the church and the notables, burn the villagers' hut, inflict on venerable men and delicate women the cruel torture of the knout, collect and deport the children and depart with threats of a new visitation. At Dudukowitz, the Uniites refuse for eleven years to appear in the Russian church or accept the Russian pope. They baptized their own children and were married by their aged men, a wretched tolerance being exercised by their governor for such money as they could put together. Finally, in 1854, on the eve of the Crimean War, all the brave confessors of the village were exiled en masse to Serbia. These inhuman measures were repeated in many parishes. The interrogatory of the twelve-year-old swineherd Stefan Suswinitswik is characteristics of the temper and principles both of the persecution and the persecuted. It deserves, as do many other pages of its history, to be written on plates of gold. The cause of Catholic unity can never perish while it can inspire such accents of devotion on the lips of babes and sucklings. Moreover, there can be no truth in the charges of ancient wrongs done by the Latin clergy to the ancestors of these Uniites, so long as it can be shown that in Uniite villages of 1839 there existed not only no resentful memory of this alleged violence, but on the contrary, a great respect and love for Catholic unity, visible in the headship of the Bishop of Rome. It is to the accident of her evasion that we owe the knowledge of these sufferings to Mother Irina and her companions. These pages, typical of a thousand similar wrongs, stirred the heart of Catholic Europe and revealed abundantly the depths of violence and mendacity that existed and the official heart of Russia. But for any softening of the same, they might as well have been cast on the winds that sweep at the endless steppes of Muscovy. The following is an excerpt from the book Pictures of Christian Heroism, published in 1855. The Nuns of Minsk for three centuries there has been established in Poland a Greek church in connection with the Holy See, and bitter is the hatred with which it has been uniformly regarded by the Russian government. Of late years, more strenuous efforts than ever have been made to oblige or to persuade the Roman Catholics to forsake the true fold and unite themselves to the national establishment of Russia, the Greek schismatics. In some instances these efforts have unhappily been successful and about ten or twelve years since, even three bishops apostatized, taking with them a considerable portion of the people. These bishops were immediately rewarded with high honors, and they spared no exertions to ingratiate themselves still further with their imperial master, by bringing over, if possible, the faithful remnant of their late flocks. Shimazko, the apostate bishop of Minsk, especially distinguished himself in this unhallowed labor, and the following narrative may be relied upon as supplying details of the most incredible brutalities of which he was guilty in his endeavor to overcome the constancy of a religious community in his diocese. Chapter 1. Expulsion of the Nuns from Minsk At the time of the apostasy of Shimesko, there was a convent of Basilian nuns in the town, who employed themselves, under their rule, in the service of God, the instruction of children, and the relief of the poor. They were called the Daughters of the Holy Trinity, and the superior was the Reverend Mother Irina Makrina Mechisalanska, or Mother Makrina, as we shall more briefly call her. Their piety, goodness, and charity had endeared them to the country round, but Shimesko only hated them the more on account of their very virtue, and was determined to gain them over to the schism at any cost for he well knew that to gain them would be to gain the whole town. The emperor had empowered him to deal with his refractory diocese as the interests of religion might require, a phrase, the true significance of which will appear from the sequel, and he had issued a decree putting at the disposal of the bishop military force if it should be required. 
Mother Macrina saw in this decree the death warrant of her community, either in this world or in the next, according as they should have courage to hold out for the love of Christ, or the weakness to yield, and she assembled her nuns and put before them the choice. They were not long in deciding, and when Shemesco summoned them to surrender their faith, they with one voice refused to obey. He was furious at their refusal, but said that the emperor would allow them three months to reconsider their determination. Mother Macrina proposed to the sisters that they should seek some safer asylum till the storm blew over. And you, said they, what will you do? I, she replied with angelic sweetness, but invincible determination, I will die at my post if I have not snatched from it by force. Then let us hear no more of flight, they rejoined, for our duty is to die at your side. So they all resolved to bear patiently the worst. Three days had scarcely elapsed when Shimesco, accompanied by the civil governor of Minsk and an armed troop, broke into the convent at five o'clock in the morning, just as the nuns were leaving their cells to assemble and choir. The soldiers placed themselves at the doors of their rooms to prevent their going back into them, and then Shimesco harangued them as follows. By his majesty's orders I give you three months, but I come at the third day, for the evil might become worse. This is the last moment of liberty you will have. You may still choose between the riches you now possess, in addition to those which the magnanimity of the emperor is ready to add to them if you join the orthodox religion, and the hardship of Serbia if you persist in your refusal. Well then, we choose the best, was the immediate answer, namely, labor in Serbia rather than abandon Jesus Christ and his vicar. Wait a while, he replied with a sneer, and you will tell a different tale. When the knot has taken off the skin you were born in, and another skin has covered your bones, you will have been more tractable. After kneeling to take leave of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, a consolation granted them by the civil governor, although refused by Shimesco, the nuns rose to depart. One only remained upon her knees. Her sisters proceeded to raise her, but she was dead. Her heart had broken at being driven away from her peaceful retirement, where she had served God for thirty years. On leaving the church, Mother Macrina threw herself at the governor's feet, and entreated his permission to carry a crucifix away with them. Shimesco tried to prevent it, and had himself snatched from their hands a crucifix of silver and enriched with precious stones which contained the relics of St. Basil. But the governor allowed them to take one made of wood, and which they ordinarily used in the processions. Notwithstanding its weight, Mother Macrina carried it, resting it on her shoulder from Minsk to Witbisk, and the more she suffered from the pressure, the more she loved the sacred wound on the left shoulder of Jesus, where the cross rested during his passage to Calvary. The nuns were changed two and two together. The first day they were driven fifteen leagues, and most of the sisters sank again and again from exhaustion. Nevertheless, they were urged on, and in seven days they arrived at Witebisk. There they were lodged in a convent of black nuns, as they were called. These were mostly widows of Russian soldiers, and women of abandoned character. The house itself had belonged to a community of Basilian sisters, who had been turned out to make way for these black nuns, and fourteen of them were now found in irons by Mother Macrina. At their request she adopted them as her own daughters, and from that time she, they shared all the sufferings of the nuns of Minsk. Their daily life was in this fashion. Before six o'clock in the morning they had to sweep the house, light the fires, and prepare the wood and water for the house. Then for six hours they had to break stones, and wheel them away in barrows, to which they were chained. From twelve to one they were allowed to rest, then hard labor again till dark, when they were required to attend the cattle and finish the household work. Their sufferings were greatly aggravated by the wanton cruelty of the black nuns, who purposely soiled the house and upset the water. The labors of the day over, they were shut up in their prison without having their irons taken off. It was cold and damp, and their only bed was a little straw, but to make up for all, they had their crucifix. At its feet they knelt at night, saying their office, and praying for the conversion of the emperor, allowing themselves only two hours for sleep. Their food was so miserable that in summer they lived on herbs, 
and in the winter on what was given to the animals. But the black nuns grudged them even this, saying that they did not deserve even pig's meat. Nor was this all, notwithstanding the severity of a Polish winter, they were allowed no fuel, so that their limbs were often frozen, and their wounds became more and more tender. Not the least part of their sufferings was the loss of Holy Communion, and they lamented the absence of their old director, Michalowicz, whom they had not seen since they left Minsk, when, therefore, one day he entered their cell, they ran to meet him with cries of joys, but they were immediately repulsed by the strange expression upon his countenance. They did not know that he had apostatized, and that he came not to administer the comfort of the sacraments, but as Shemezko's bidding, who had counted much of his influence to persuade them to desist from their opposition. They resisted his suggestion with the more horror that they had once regarded him with so much love, and he became, as we shall presently see, the most bitter of their persecutors. Shemezko was determined to put an end to the struggle by some decisive step. With this view, he ordered them to be scourged. Mikhailowicz, to whom the execution of the order was committed, increased the severity of the torture. Instead of thirty lashes, he made them number fifty, and had the floggings repeated twice a week. On every Wednesday and Saturday all the sisters underwent this fearful infliction, and he stood by and watched for some sigh or groan in token of submission, but in vain. He heard naught but the prayer, by thy cross and passion, Jesus, save my soul, which each sitter uttered at every lash. When he heard it not, it was because heaven had opened its gates to receive another martyr. The sisters prepared themselves for the scourging by meditation on the passion of Jesus Christ. They were compelled to witness each other's sufferings, but all the while the torture lasted, they thought they saw him scourged, and gathered strength rather than terror from the sight. Their greatest pain was that this scourging was carried out in the presence of the Russian clergy and other men. But even this grave, too, only united them more closely to the shame of Jesus. What? said one to Mother Macrina. Did you not utter a single cry during all these horrible tortures? No, she replied. We were too much engaged in prayer. Only at first we prayed at the top of our voice, then, in a more subdued tone, and at length sometimes, she added with tears, not at all, and then we knew that the blows fell upon a corpse. But did not nature sometimes rebel? Yes, but with the help of God we became used to everything. At first the scourging was terrible to look forward to, but after a time we all came up, each in her turn, to receive the lashes without being called. And yet pieces of flesh adhered to the scourges, and the torture continued for a whole month. The first who died from the scourging was Sister Columba. She was dragged from the torture to her labor and died immediately. Sister Susan expired under the lash, and Sister Situva the following night, with her eyes fixed on the crucifix and her head resting on the knees of Mother Macrina. Nor were these three the only martyrs. Sister Baptista was burnt alive by the black nuns, who, it is believed, were in a state of intoxication at the time, and Sister Nepomucian was killed by a blow on the head. Another, Sister Coletta, had her ribs broken and died in consequence. But still the constancy of the survivors remained unshaken, and Michalowicz, who had promised Shimesko that in a short time he would bring them all over, began to receive reproaches, not unmixed with threats for his delay. Accordingly, he hit upon another plan. He divided the sisters into four different bands and shut them up separately in the hope that he should then have less difficulty with them. The place in which he confined Mother Macrina with eight of her nuns was a cave so damp that the whole place swarmed with worms, which crawled all over their person and into their mouths, ears, and noses, if for a moment they tried to compose themselves to sleep. They had only putrid vegetables given them to eat, but yet they were happier than they had been since they had left Minsk, and they composed a hymn which they sung continually, and of which we venture to offer a translation. My God, it is thy will, the burden sore thou dost ordain. For thee we suffer still to suffer more, our strength sustain. Torn from thy house by traitors, 
were so sweet the toil each day. Whom shall we ask for pity, at whose feet our sorrows lay? My God, look down upon our country, turn to joy our care, and schism from her people bid her spurn, tis all our prayer. Suffer, ye servants of the Lord, who staunch and true, still preserves, one day the triumph of the faith shall view, and dry his tears. Then shall we break our bands, then burst the chains that bind us fast. Thy blessed will be done, in heaven remains our crown at last. Michalowicz wrote to Shemesko that they were all ready to recant, and he promised to come immediately and receive their abjuration. In the meanwhile he redoubled his efforts to make his words good, going round to all the dungeons with a paper for the poor inmates to sign, to which he declared that the others had already given to their adhesion. He lies, said Mother Macrina. The wretch, he lies. No one has signed. Of that I am certain. Give me the paper. And she tore it from his hands. Not a signature was there. Pale with shame, Michalowicz clutched up a handful of filth, stuffed it in her mouth, and then slunk away. The next time they had found themselves all together with their wheelbarrows, they saluted each other with unspeakable joy, and fell on their knees to thank God for another victory, singing the Te Deum. Now, my children, said Mother Macrina cheerfully, we have a good rest. Let us try and work hard. To work, to work. When Shimesco arrived to pay the sisters the promised visit, he addressed Macrina as Mother General, and brought with him a superb cross from the Emperor, but when he went on to say that he came at their invitation, they thought he was raving. At the same time, an involuntary feeling of alarm came over them, lest there should be a traitor among them. The sisters gazed silently on one another, but at last all eyes rested on Mother Macrina. "'Infamous creature!' she exclaimed. "'What have you said? Who has invited you hither?' "'You yourself,' he replied. At these words the sisters uttered a cry of distress, a most sullen silence succeeded, when Mother Macrina snatched from Shemesco's hand the pretended petition, opened it, and in the presence of the sisters, and at once recognized Michalowicz's writing, with indignation and contempt she flung the paper back in his face. He attempted to brave out the forgery with another lie. "'Blood of a Polish dog!' he exclaimed. "'Have you not all licked my feet, asking me a great favor to make in your name this humble supplication?' "'And do you not fear God, who you offend by so barefaced a falsehood?' said the Holy Mother. "'You know better than any one that we neither fear death nor martyrdom. How could we have then beseech you to bring us your accomplice to receive our apostasy?' Then she mezco, she said, "'That cross which you bring me from the Emperor, suspend on your own breast, already so richly decorated. Once a thief hung upon a cross, now a cross hangs upon a thief. Go!' Never will you succeed in tempting God's servants. No sooner had Shemezko left them than that she, with tears of joy, thanked God for the grace he had just given them. All the sisters pressed round Mother Macrina and gave that vent to their feelings which the presence of the apostate bishop had so long prevented. The following day before he left, Shemezko caused them to be scourged under his windows, and Michalowicz revenged himself for his disgrace by fresh cruelties. The heavy copper pitcher of water which with they had to carry, Michalowicz now obliged them to bear at arm's length in order, as he said, that the Polish spirit might not get into the water. It was a great distance, particularly in the winter, when they had to take a long round to get at the river. If, exhausted with fatigue, they drew the pitchers near to them, the black nuns, who accompanied them everywhere, would snatch the pitcher from their hands and empty the contents on their head. They had then to begin over again. When Shemesco came again, it was so to reconcile a Uniite church to the Russo-Greek rite, and he was determined that Mother Macrina and her nuns should assist at the ceremony. This they firmly refused, and the apostate bishop accordingly gave orders that they should be brought in by force. Bleeding and bruised, they were dragged to the door of the church, where a great crowd had assembled, much to Shemesco's confusion, who would rather have been without so many witnesses. Mother Macrina, whose head was streaming with blood, caught up an axe which was lying by, and laying her head upon a block of wood, entreated Shemesco, as he had been their pastor, to now be their executioner. 
Cut off our heads and roll them into your church, for never shall our feet walk in. Here is the axe, here are our heads. Shimezko only replied by knocking the axe out of her hand. It struck one of the sisters on the leg and inflicted a severe wound. He then struck Mother Macrina on the mouth and knocked out one of her teeth. She quietly picked it up and presented it to him, saying, This is the noblest action of our life, monster, and in remembrance of it take this diamond and set it in your stony heart. Believe me, it will outshine all the jewels for which you have sold your soul. Shimezko was so stung by these words that he went away in a fit of excess of passion and was obliged to be taken away. The sisters, with fresh blows, were sent back to their labors, singing as they went the Te Deum, in which many of the people joined. Shimezko consoled himself that night by a drinking bout with the black nuns, and the house resounded with convivial songs and cheers in honor of the emperor. Mikhailovich joined in the debauchery, he who had never known the taste of strong drink before his apostasy, was now seldom sober, and was doubtless sought to deaden the reproaches of his conscience. But the day of his retribution was at hand. The wretched man fell drunk into a pool of water and drowned. Their Sufferings at Polak and Spas After two years the sisters were ordered off to Polak to assist in building a palace for Shimezko. They were tied two and two as before, and had to walk in chains. But this was not their greatest trial. Their dear crucifix was taken from them. On arriving at Polak, they were placed in a convent, which, like their late prison, also had once belonged to their own order, but was now occupied by black nuns and Russian popes. They were put under the power of the protopope Juan Wikroquin, a drunken fellow, who always carried about him with a knotted thong, with which he struck the poor sisters whenever he met them. The black nuns were much more numerous here than at Widobisk, so that their prisoners had each ten tyrants instead of one. Here, too, as at Widobisk, some of the old Catholic sisterhood were kept in confinement. There had been twenty-five, but when Mother Macrina arrived, fifteen had perished in the persecution and she found only ten sisters and one corpse. Two of these had lost their reason from blows on the head, yet they were compelled to labor with the others. One of them died soon after the arrival of the nuns of Minsk, the other six months afterwards. She was found a bloody corpse in her cell, and no doubt she had died under the blows of her executioner. The sisters were not suffered to remain long at Polak, because the townspeople used to throw them bread over the wall. So they were moved to spas, and were made to carry all the furniture of the convent to their new abode. Then they were set to level the ground for Shimezko's palace. Being new to the work, constant accidents happened, which cost the lives of many of the sisters. Five of them were buried alive by earth falling upon them as they were making an excavation. The danger was known beforehand, but no precautions were taken, and when the horrible catastrophe occurred, the witnesses of it were not allowed to do anything for the deliverance of the sufferers, and there, perhaps, they would have remained to this day, but that some brave inhabitants of Polak came by night, and having dug them out, gave them burial, and the bodies of the martyrs rest in peace. Their most painful task was breaking stones, for they had no hammers, and were obliged to break one stone against another. The labor was so great, that their arms were frequently put out of joint, but they were not on the account relieved from the necessity of breaking the required amount, and the sisters had to replace the bones in their sockets for each other. Whatever inflammation ensued, they had still to go on with their work, and they were soon covered with ulcers and tumors that broke out all over their bodies. Their clothes, one scanty petticoat was all they had, were soaked in blood and faint from want of food, racked with pain and ready to drop with fatigue. They passed the hours of labor, expecting every moment to die. Then, when night came, they could not sleep. In no position could they find rest, so covered were they with painful wounds, and they were fain to lie in each other's arms and rest aching heads on no less aching bosoms. But that God gave them strength to endure that cross, they must have all sunk beneath its weight, as it were, Three of them died in eight days. 
One was crushed to death by stones, which she had not the strength to draw to their appointed place. Obliged to let go of the rope, the bucket fell, and the poor laborer was killed. The other two sank from exhaustion. The nuns were generally not allowed to help each other. Only Mother Macrina might exchange work with any sister who was exhausted. In this way, she saved her life on one occasion, when nine sisters were killed by the falling of a wall. She was on a high scaffolding, when one of them, who was wheeling a barrel below, cried out, Mother, I can do no more. She accordingly came down, and the other went up to take her place. Almost immediately afterward came a great crash and a piercing cry. On looking round, Mother Macrina saw nothing but a cloud of dust. But when the dust had cleared away, she saw that the wall had fallen down, and that her nine sisters had disappeared under the ruins. She fainted at the sight, but they scourged her until she recovered, and then drove her to work again. This misfortune put a stop to the work for some time, and the surviving sisters were employed in breaking stones, carrying wood, and digging, but after a few weeks the building recommenced, as Shimezko was expected. He had been again informed that the sisters were at length ready to recant. He hastened thither to receive their recantation. Meanwhile they lost two more sisters from scourging. Some indignant persons had scratched on the walls of the Russian church the following droggle rhyme. Here, instead of monasteries, are Serbia and the galleys. And the poor nuns of Minsk were accused of it. They were all flogged, and with such barbarity that two of them died. When Shimezko arrived, Mother Macrina asked him who had sent for him to tempt them again. You yourself, said he. I, said the mother indignantly. Yes, you, or some of your sisters. The nuns burst out into a cry of horror. Apostate, said the heroic woman. Traitor to Jesus Christ and his church, by God's help, we will die for the faith as our sisters have died. At these words Shimezko struck her on the cheek, upon which she turned to him the other. Indeed, this seems to have been a favorite pastime of his, for in different visits he knocked out nine of her teeth. He then took from his pocket the emperor's ukas, of which we have already spoken, and made her read it aloud. It approved as holy, holy, and thrice holy, all that the archbishop Shimezko had done, or might do, for the promotion of the orthodox Greek religion, and commanded all persons, including the military, to assist him. After she read it, he took from his pocket a petition which Mother Macrina had written to the emperor, renouncing all their temporal possessions, provided they might die quietly in their own faith, and showing it to her, struck her such a blow on the face as to break the cartilage of her nose. I'll teach you to write to the emperor, said he. Then he struck her again, and taking her by the shoulders and shaking her, he threw her down and stamped upon her. At last he inquired who had written that petition. I, said the mother. All of us, said the sisters. Who gave you the paper? We got it from some poor persons. And who wrote it? We did it ourselves. His rage at this past expression. When I have taken off three skins, one that you had from God and the other two from the emperor, you will tell me the truth. The sisters were all scourged. The lashes fell without being counted. And still he stood by and asked, Who gave you the paper? Who wrote the petition? But he could find out nothing more, and at length they desisted. One of the sisters died that night, like so many others, on the mother's knees, and the next day they were driven to labor as usual. From that time forward the poor were not allowed to come near them, and, but for the Jews who gave them brandy grains, they must have perished with hunger. They could not exclude the Jews, because they owed them money for brandy. Shimezko came again the next morning, and with curses urged them to apostatize, and insisted upon knowing who had helped them with their petition. Not succeeding in obtaining the desired information, he went away, enjoining Fedor to torment them more and more, and this winter, 1841-1842, to 1842, their sufferings were greater than ever. Next spring the floggings twice a week were resumed, and they received fifty lashes each time. Sister Seraphine, who was seventy-two years of age, died under the infliction. At the thirtieth lash the name of Jesus was no more heard. Her soul was already in heaven. Twenty yet remained to complete the sentence, and they were given to the corpse. 
Two other sisters also died, one two hour afterwards, and the other not till midnight. Oh, my Jesus, said Sister Natalie, come and console me, for I love you with all my heart. And so saying, she expired. After the sixth scourging, the Russian general, moved by the entreaties of his wife, interfered. They went to the house just as the flogging was about to commence. When his wife saw all the preparations, she swooned away, and the general told the protopope that if he obeyed the orders of the apostate bishop, he would have him hanged, for the emperor could not be aware of their horrible cruelty. He had them taken back to prison and sent them ten rubles in order that they might be enabled to procure themselves some food. They, however, did not enjoy the benefit of this charity, for the protopope appropriated the whole of it. Nor were they much the better for his interference, for although the floggings were discontinued, Shemezko was so enraged with the general that he advised yet worse torments than any that had gone before. One evening the sisters were brought home from their work earlier than usual, and the deacons, the popes, and a number of savage men, mad with drink and every evil passion, were turned in upon those defenseless women, with full license to work their will with them. God preserved them through that fearful night. He alone knows how, but the morning dawned on a bloody heap of dead, or mutilated, though still bleeding bodies. Two of the sisters were no more. One lay crushed with the iron hoof of one of those wild beasts. The other was one mass of wounds, so that the fatal blow could not be distinguished. Eight sisters, though alive, had had their eyes forced out and their faces torn. One had their nose bitten off. All were horribly bruised and bitten, and gashed and trampled on, and the floor of the prison was slippery with their blood. Mother Macrina was stabbed in the side in three places and in the arm, besides a gash on the head. Yet, when she asked to be allowed, wounded as she herself was, to dress the wounds of her children, they bore her away from the cell because she would not purchase the boon by deserting her faith. When Fedor came to remove the dead bodies, his only remark to the nuns was, See how God punishes you. This outrage did not pass without comment either from God or man. That night, nine cattle belonging to the black nuns died in the field, and their four horses were found dead in the stables the next morning. It was a judgment from God in token of his displeasure, and even under Russian tyranny the populace was roused. The excitement gathered strength, though the authorities adopted every possible expedient to arrest it. One gentleman was taken in his own house, and without a trial sent to Serbia, for having had a requiem said for the dead nuns and a convent of Dominicans, which had long been recognized in the country, was broken up and dispersed at a moment's warning for saying prayers for the martyred sisters. But Polak was not intimidated, and Shimezko thought it safe to change the scene of his operations. There was another house of black nuns at Medozoli, and thither the sisters were dispatched. First, however, they received a visit from a Franciscan father named Filocci, who had sold himself to the schism, and become the bosom friend of Shimezko. The nuns did not know this, and when they saw a Catholic priest their hearts leaped with joy in the hope of confession and communion. They remarked it as somewhat strange that he only gave them alms and no spiritual consolation, but he seemed ashamed of his apostasy, and it was not till his second visit that he ventured to recommend their giving up their faith, when he employed the following notable argument. If union and orthodoxy be one and the same thing, then what more holy than Shemezko's desire that under the same monarch there should be but one religion? The sisters were stupefied, and the mother asked, Who sent you? I am sent by God, he said, to save your souls, which you have steeped in hell by your obstinacy. Ah, retorted the holy mother, if our souls are in hell, then your own place, Judas, is in heaven. At these words he was going to strike her, when one of the sisters seized him by the shoulders and with the help of the others turned him out of the door. His rage against them was extreme, and some time afterwards, before they left Polak, he found means to gratify it. At his instigation, Shimezko had them shut up for six days and fed on salt herrings, without a drop of water or atom of food. The raging thirst they at first endured exceeded description. The two first days the agony was insupportable, a burning fire devoured their inside, and the skin of their tongue and palate peeled off with fever. 
But still, the passion of Jesus sustained them. They thought of his thirst upon the cross. They thought also of the thirst of the souls in purgatory. And they fell on their faces, offering to God their sufferings in their behalf. God had pity upon them. For that moment they felt neither thirst nor hunger. And on the seventh morning, when they were taking to their labors, they made a vow to abstain from water for that day also, in honor of the seven sorrows of Mary. When Ivan saw that they were not yet conquered, he said, You must have a devil within you who suffers in your stead. The Escape of Mother Macrina It was in the spring of 1843 that one day they perceived the courtyard of the convent full of armed men. As the presence of the soldiers always initiated a change of abode for the sisters, they knew they were going to leave Polak, and they felt convinced that they were destined for Serbia. So much the better, said they all. We shall suffer the more. And they sang a hymn in honor of the archangel Michael. But in this expectation they were deceived. One more attempt was to be made to break the resolution, and their present destination was to Madzoili, a town in the government of Minsk. They set off at night, and all had to go on foot, except those who had lost the use of their limbs. Even the poor blind nuns, and those suffering from undressed wounds, had to march with the rest. It was a ghastly procession. Yet they bore their sufferings of that toilsome journey for ten days with the same heroic patience. As they were crossing the Deniper, their conductor seemed uneasy lest they should jump into the river to rid themselves of their torments. Is the river heaven that we should jump into it? said one of the sisters, divining the cause of his agitation. On arriving at Madzoili, they were delivered into the hands of the protopope Daniel. The black nuns there received them with jeers and laughter. How fat and fresh you all are! But you have had nothing to try you yet. Wait a little. We will find out how to pull you down. The sisters were then set to the most disgusting offices. To their shame they found their two bazillion monks who had apostatized, and were among the most cruel of their tormentors. They stole the linen which the sisters had to wash for the household, and pawned it to the Jews for brandy, and the sisters were accused of the theft and beaten. They had not been long here when they were again divided into four parties and separated, and each was then told that the others had recanted. The miserable falsehood, however, availed nothing. They had too much confidence in each other's constancy, and when they all assembled again, they found their number complete. Shimezko paid them a visit in the autumn, and in the presence of the convent and a number of children, assumed a gentle tone, spoke in their own language, offered to put the children under their care, and after reasoning with them, pointed to a small packet on the table and said, That is ready for you as soon as you embrace the Orthodox religion. They replied that they feared neither torments nor death for Jesus Christ, for they would live and die for him, nor would they teach the children of schismatics except to bring them up in the Catholic faith. Shimezko, in a rage, swore that they should be beaten. Just what we wanted to ask you for, said Sister Merseka. You will go to hell if you persist, cries Shimezko. Oh, my God, was the answer. How merciful art thou to endure the presence of such an apostate? Shimezko then ordered that they should be tortured in a new way. They were tied up in sacks with large ropes around their neck and taken to the side of one of the lakes surrounding the convent. Now, said he, embrace our religion, or I will drown you. We will not give up Jesus Christ, said they all, so demon, do as you bid. The assistants accordingly jumped into a boat and rowed from the shore, pulling the sisters into the water and towing them behind. Before they were out of their depth, the rowers stopped and made the old offer to receive the same indignant refusal. Then they went into deeper water and rowed them about for three hours, the cord all the while nearly strangling them. After this they were taken back to their prison. They were kept all night in their wet clothes, and the water running off made mud of the prison floor. All their old wounds festered from the cold and damp, and new ones broke out all over their bodies. This punishment was repeated twice a week for three weeks, and was only discontinued on account of the freezing of the water. 
On the third occasion, three of the sisters died in the water. Their bodies were put into a hole by the side of the lake, but the inhabitants of Madzoili gave them a decent burial the same night. The ensuing winter was a very severe one for the poor sisters. Their wounds opened afresh with the ice, and they grew weaker and weaker. They were allowed to get wood from the forest, but chained as they were, they could scarcely bear the weight. And when they had it, their stove would not carry off the smoke, and one of the sisters was suffocated, another was frozen to death in the forest. The winter after was still more severe, and at its close only four remained, who were not either blind or paralytic, out of all three of the united sisterhoods. Nevertheless, it was determined to send them to Serbia to end their days there. Had this intention been carried into effect, nothing would have transpired of all this history, but Almighty God designed that the world should know what schismatic barbarity can perpetrate. Mother Macrina, with three of her companions, at length, effected their escape. On the occasion of the protopope's fiat, the whole of the inmates were intoxicated for three successive days. On the evening of the third day, Mother Macrina found her guards asleep in their places. She passed them, and roused the three sisters who still retained the use of their limbs. They reached the top of the wall by the help of the trees, and notwithstanding its height, after commending themselves to God, let themselves drop on the snow. When they found themselves all uninjured, transported with joy, they knelt down and recited the Te Deum. In order to battle pursuit, and to secure at least the escape of one to tell the tale, they separated, appointing to meet at a certain town on the frontier. Mother Macrina pursued her difficult journey, or rather wanderings, amid the Lithuanian forest for three months, bagging her way, beset with spies, and enduring the greatest extremities of cold, hunger, and thirst. From many persons she received great kindness, but the names have been carefully concealed, that they might not incur the vengeance of the Tsar. At length she arrived at the town where she was to meet the sisters, but only one was there, Sister Marseca. At a later period she ascertained that the other two had reached Galatia. After eight days she set off, and having crossed the frontier, crawling on her hands and feet among a herd of cattle, and so escaped the last Russian sentinel, she reached Posen in safety, where she only wished to live a retired and humble life of devotion. But the archbishop obliged her to draw up a circumstantial account of her sufferings. Though the Grand Duchy of Posen she passed via Paris to Rome, where, by the command of the Pope, she dictated to three officials the startling history which her own humility would have concealed. She carries on her person the marks of her seven years of martyrdom. Her neck is seen by the rope which she was dragged in the water of Madzoili. Her feet are galled by the chains, and her head retains the scar which she received on the dreadful night at Spas. She is still living at Rome, where she has now established a house of her order. She is more than sixty years of age, but her mind is as vigorous as ever, and the truth of her narrative is stamped upon her features. The Russian government has attempted to refute the whole story, and has had recourse to this end to the most contemptible subterfuges. But the Tsar, when he faced His Holiness in 1845, was unable to deny to the face of the Vicar of Christ what he had not scrupled to deny in official documents. He was speechless, went out abashed and confounded from his presence. Of the blind and paralytic sisters who were left behind, two died a few days after Mother Macrina's flight, and all the others were placed in a hospital, after a long resistance on the part of Shimesco, who would only give his consent on the condition of their receiving communion once at least from the hands of a schismatic. At last he gave in, when he found he could not prevail, but he strictly charged the officers of the hospital never to let a Catholic priest have access to them. This is the true story of one convent of Basilian nuns, but the whole order endured the same persecution, and of the 245 religious of whom it was composed, not one fell away. There is no reason to suppose that the government had any special hatred to this community, and as all were as constant as they, it is probable that the story of the nuns of Minsk is the story of every other convent of the Basilian order. We continue now with the persecution of the Catholic Church by Tsar Nicholas I. 
In the latter part of 1832, the Pope repeatedly attempted to obtain some redress for the suffering of the Catholics. He desired, among other things, the presence of a papal agent at St. Petersburg, but this measure of confidence and justice was never agreed to by the Tsar. While the compulsory conversion of the Ruthenians went bravely on, the cruelties practiced on the Catholic Poland increased. Only evasive or imprudent answers were vouchsafed the letter of the Pope, and he could soon convince himself that the Tsar had overreached him, played upon his well-known detestation of revolutionary principles, and taken advantage of his monastic simplicity and an experience of the world. While Nicholas had exhorted from him was not a weapon against the revolution, but one against Catholicism itself. The Russian government continued to affect a total ignorance of all the facts quoted by the Pope in his correspondence, oppression of the clergy, confiscation of the convent properties, deportation of thousands of Polish children to schismatic territories. While the Pope invoked the Treaty of 1773 that guaranteed the liberty of the Catholic religion, the Emperor replied that since the insurrection of Poland had only such rights as he cared to allow. This quiet nullification by the local authorities of even the miserable privileges of a persecuted race and religion is one of the most odious forms of Russian oppression. The offender is seldom or never punished. He knows too well that he is, above all, an agent of extermination. That the system has not changed may be seen from the following fact. Appeal to the law and you invite the revenge of a horde of officials, who rarely lose an opportunity of showing their contempt for the laws. We recall the cruel cynicism with which the Tsar denied that he had ever given the famous order of April 10, 1832, for the deportation of Minsk of all the children in the Kingdom of Poland between 6 and 17, with the eventual purpose of sending them to the distant and inhospitable military colonies of the frontier. Several years afterwards, in 1834 and 1838, the children of Polish nobles were still sold in their native villages at thirty dollars a head. No wonder that a Polish mother cast herself upon the body of her exiled child and plunged a poignard into his heart, rather than see him stripped at one blow of mother, religion, and fatherland. The Russian agents at Rome continued to implore the Pope not to listen to any reports of religious affairs in Poland, save such as reached him through the hands of the Tsar's accredited representatives. But the anti-Catholic matrimonial legislation of 1836, the cruel treatment and forced resignation of the brave bishop of Hodlachia, Marcellius Gokowski, the ineffable dishonor of the Ruthenian apostasy, the prohibition in 1840 to use any longer the term Greek Uniite, these unjust and oppressive acts that covered the decade from 1832 to 1842 moved at last a long-suffering pope to the magnificent allocution of July 22, 1842, in which he made known to the Catholic world his constant and numerous but useless efforts for the welfare of Catholicism in Poland, and rose above himself by the touching narrative of his deception by the Tsar, whereby he had given cause to the faithful of Poland to believe that the Holy See had abandoned them to their enemy. But if Pope Gregory could be deceived, he could not be restrained from making a public confession of the facts in the case. When patience had ceased to be a virtue, and the opinion of his entourage had become noticeably adverse, he broke a long silence and delivered before the assembled cardinals the famous allocution we have just referred to. Despite all contrary accusations, he had never been wanting in zeal and resolution to improve the condition of Polish Catholicism. He declared that he had been circumvented by its enemies after their habitual fraudulent manner. He had long borne the accusations of negligence, complicity, and even cowardice, and had come to know that not a few looked on him as a stumbling block and a stone of scandal. He would now, however, relate in their true order and meaning all the phases of the negotiations with Tsar Nicholas since the beginning of his pontificate. While the papal expose of facts did not greatly relieve the sufferings of Catholics of Poland, it simplified the political situation by the removal of all equivocal sentiment as the attitude of the papacy. It also restored to the latter its liberty of action and arrested a growing discontent among the very faithful children of the Roman Church. Three years later, Tsar Nicholas came to Rome. His meeting with Gregory the Sixteenth was a historic one, 
although no reliable account of their mutual discourse has ever been made known. In his Recollections of the Last Four Popes, Cardinal Wiseman has left us a graphic account of the imperial visit to the Vatican that has often been quoted, but can never lose a certain racy vigor of expression we quote at length. The most painful of his conflicts, however, was one face to face with the greatest of Europe's sovereigns, a man accustomed to command without contradiction and to be surrounded by complete submission. He did not imagine that there was a human being who would presume to read him a lesson, or still less to administer him a rebuke. It may be proper to premise that the present emperor of Russia, while Tsarowicz, visited Rome and was received with the utmost respect by all ranks and with extreme kindness by the Pope. The young prince expressed himself highly gratified by this reception, and I was told by those whom he had declared he had procured himself a portrait of Gregory, which he said he would always keep as that of a friend deeply venerated and esteemed. Still, he had not ceased to deal harshly, not to say cruelly, with his Catholic subjects, especially the Polish. They were driven into the Greek communion by putting it out of their power to follow their own worship. They were deprived of their own bishops and priests, and even persecuted by more violent inflictions and personal sufferings. On this subject the Holy See had both publicly and privately complained, but no redress and but little, if any alleviation had been obtained. At length, in December 1845, Empress Nicholas I came himself to Rome. It was observed both in Italy and I believe in England, how minute and unrelaxed were the precautions taken to secure him against any danger of conspiracy. Be this as it may, nothing amiss befell him, unless it was this interview with the head of the church which he had mercilessly persecuted. With him, whose rival he considered himself as real autocrat, head of a large proportion of which he called the Orthodox Church, and as recognized protector of its entire communion. The Pope's own account of the meeting was brief, simple, and full of conscious power. Quote, I said to him all that the Holy Ghost dictated to me, end quote, and that he had not spoken vainly with words that had beaten the air, but that their strokes had been well placed and driven home. There was evidence otherwise recorded. An English gentleman was in some part of the palace through which the imperial visitor passed as he returned from the interview, and described his altered appearance. He had entered with his usual firm and royal aspect, grand as it was from statue-like features, stately frame and martial bearing, free and at ease, with gracious looks and condescending gestures of salutation. So he passed through the long suite of ante-rooms, the imperial eagle, glossy, fiery, with plumes unruffled and eye unquenched, in all the glories of pinions which no flight had ever wearied, with beak and talon which no prey had ever resisted. He came forth again, with head uncovered and hair, if it can be said of a man, disheveled, haggard, and pale, looking as though in an hour he had passed through the condensation of a protracted fever, taking long strides, with stooping shoulders, unobservant and unsaluting. But let us be fully just. The interview did not excite rancorous or revengeful feelings. No doubt the pontiff's words were in the spirit of those on the high priest's breastplate, doctrine and truth, sound in principle and true in fact. They convinced and persuaded. Facts, with their proofs, had no doubt been carefully prepared and could not be again said. The strong emotion which Gregory, on other occasions, easily betrayed could not have been restrained here. Often in prayer has every beholder seen the tears running down his glowing countenance, often those who have approached him with a tale of distress, or stood by when news of a crime has been communicated him, have seen his features quiver, and his eyes dim with the double sorrow of the apostle. All this must be told effectually, where there could be nothing to reply. Mistaken zeal, early prejudice, and extravagance of national feelings had no doubt influenced the conduct of the Tsar towards his Catholic subjects against the better impulses of his own nature, which Russians always considered just, generous, and even parental. The Concordat, signed in 1848 between Russia and the Holy See, was never executed with honesty and equity. The new Russian criminal code made penal, and therefore made an illusion, nearly every right granted by the Concordat. Holowinski, the Catholic Archbishop of Mohilu, laid bare all the ways of oppression, violent and hypocritical, that were followed during the remainder of the reign of Nicholas. The latter died in 1855, 
after a successful consolidation of his personal authority and an equally successful series of campaigns against obsolete Persia and decrepit Turkey. He had extended the limits of the state, but had not deepened or ennobled the popular life. Yet he was bound to behold his empire insulted in the Crimea War. He died in a kind of dumb, impenitent despair, 1855. An unbending man of iron will, dogmatic confidence in himself, and a firm persuasion that the proper destiny of mankind was an unquestioning obedience to the will of the successors of the Tsar.